Uh, hi folks, uh, we are here with one more episode of the Supply Chain Show. Uh, I've got Ian, which we'll introduce in, in, in a minute. Today's topic is the, the famous debate we had on LinkedIn actually on, on demand driven versus uh, demand driven MRP versus uh, MRP. So I'm a, I'm a practitioner of MRP. I have some strong, strong, let's call it concepts and experience. And being a novice, this concept, I, I don't know much. And I'm a novice, I want to learn. So today we have an expert, uh, Ian here. Ian, please introduce yourself. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Uh, well, as a consultant, all I need to be is more knowledgeable than the person I'm dealing with. Yeah. So I wouldn't put myself out to be one of the foremost experts in DDMRP. So what I am is a, a practitioner, supply chain procurement who came across DDMRP, learned quite a lot about it. Yep. And and I'm almost the, uh, the heckler from the sidelines because I'm not accountable for managing supply chain today. Yeah. I'm thinking, I wish I'd have known this 20 years ago. So anybody who is, yeah. I'm more than happy to jump on my soapbox Good. and say, have you heard about this? Do you realize it's different? And it might make your life a lot better. Easier. Right? And this is where we want to, 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 to understand today, right? Because uh, I see on LinkedIn, you know, a lot of consultant and experienced folks, they they make this uh, claim of you know it's gonna make your life easier and better. So we come we come to that actually. Yeah. But let's I would like to it's always good to understand the history, right? So we knew the founders, you know, you know Carol and uh, and uh, Mr. Smith, right? Yeah. So let's start with some history, how it is developed, where it has come from, why the word, why the word demand driven. Okay, and again, it, it's my understanding of where DDMRPs come from. So I'll be mostly correct. Uh, a couple of areas. I, I understand the term demand driven came from the work that Carol Patak, one of the founders of the Demand Driven Institute, mm -hmm. was doing when she was uh, a VP for PeopleSoft. So they were, they were thinking about how do we make the supply, manufacturing, replenishment elements of our ERP system truly pull, okay. uh, demand driven. And they, they coined the term. Uh, then Oracle bought PeopleSoft yeah. and my understanding was they were taking a different strategy, the development work about demand driven, pull based software was shelved uh, and Carol went on to do other things as often happens when mergers and acquisitions take place. Yep. So, in parallel with this, starting a few years earlier, uh, Carol Smith, uh, working with Deborah Smith, who had originally worked with uh, Ellie Goldratt and the Community Developing Theory of Constraints, they were building on the simple principles of theory of constraints, manufacturing and supply chain management mm -hmm. in very large companies where you need to interface the simple tools and techniques of theory of constraints with the large data requirements mm -hmm. and, and your systems of record, which ERP systems have become. Yep. So, so they were sort of doing two things. One was working out how to improve the know-how and knowledge and overcome the practical day-to-day -day problems yep. of a true pull supply chain that can apply in lots of different circumstances, yeah. from fast moving consumer goods to uh, steel mills and oil mills. And you know, all so, and, stuff, yeah. and, and, and Chad and Carol came together and, and realized that they'd been approaching the, the same issue from different dimensions. Uh, then they formed the Demand Driven Institute. Yeah. Uh, so, Chad stopped working as a consultant, he, uh, he, he stepped away from his uh, involvement with uh, software companies became independent and the two of them went on their mission to sort of spread the word and said this is some method that other people can use mm -hmm. uh, it's generated some great results off you go and, and I think that started eight nine years ago they had some articles in Apex they yeah. updated all Dickies 
they brought their own book out and started training people. So, so, so uh, American Production Institute, I think uh, I just learned today, they've rebranded themselves, right? So good learning for me as well. Yeah. So do they back it up as one of the part of the curriculums or they just say, okay, right now we want to keep it out of it. So what, where, where are they, because they are one of the, let's call it the standard bodies, yeah. right? You know, they are one of the, everyone, everyone knows, knows this, you know, CPIM, CSCP, you know, when I hire people, they, I always ask, so where, where do they stand with that? Uh, I'm probably out of date. Yeah. I certainly know that demand driven is spoken about as a key element of various apex regional conferences around the world mm -hmm. and that will vary from region to region I, I certainly know that bit but some of the conferences that i followed from afar mm -hmm. are now predominantly demand driven case studies are discussed and talked about mm -hmm. uh, as for where it is in the curriculum i understand that there's a close partnership and a strategy between the Demand Driven Institute and APIX or the Association for Supply Management. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know the details of that. Okay, so that's something it, to explore, yeah. It was certainly an element of the earlier program that APIX had. Right. But like is often the case with professional bodies, it's one of a number of options. They they include something for everybody in there. And yeah, well, perfect. So now I want to jump into the the, the, the part where I, I, uh, I want to learn more and, and debate more, shall I say, yeah. right? is the MRP and versus the demand demand break. So uh, MRP, old logic, 1956, is a mathematical model. Yeah. So when I hire a planner and demander, one of the questions uh, I ask, okay, explain me the logic of MRP. And I find it astonishing, right? You know, less than 50% people can actually explain me the, how the MRP grid works. You know, you have to have, you know, three demand triggers, your forecasts, yeah. your orders, your, your safety buffers, you need to know your time fences, you need to know planning and packing, you need to know, you know, how the bill of material works, um, and so on. So again, the whole, the whole piece of the MRP logic works over the period of time. And I learned more because I was working for a manufacturing where we have a lot of Kanban in place, etc. So I was, I was a planner working with this and then we outsource. So as soon as we outsource to China and India, we've gone from everything in-house vertical manufacturing to you know, almost buying finished goods and sub-assemblies yeah. sub finished goods from, from India and China with 8 to 12 weeks lead time, then I had no choice but to work with the focus, right? Yeah. So hence, I, my dependency on, on a strong MRP management, you know, having the right safety stock, right, having the right batch order quantity, having the, having, having the right, uh, let's call it, time fences in the system was pretty important because still the customer lead time was five days. So what I want to know, so if, I, if someone like me who knows I like to think of MRP, and now to understand the entry cases or the technical part of demand driven MRP. So, what is the difference? Okay, um, and again, you know an awful lot more about MRP than me, so forgive me for the, for the errors I made. It's okay. Yeah, I'm not the expert to talk to, but hopefully I'll do a good enough job. Uh, and, and, and I think you touched upon it, Madhasu, in, in what you were just saying, in that when you ask experienced people, a lot of people who are working with it and should know don't know the intricacies of MRP. Yep. And, and it, it's become that a very small number of experienced people with the right professional intuition know what to do, what not to do, what the workarounds are. Mm -hmm. But for most people, the, the fundamental underlying problem, as I understand it, is the mathematics are very deterministic. Yep. They, the, the calculation nets everything to zero when it's run. Uh, it, it's based on the input conditions, which are very often a forecast. Mm -hmm. As if we're to achieve this forecast, this is exactly what we need to do. We need to make those things on this date. We need to order 15 of those and 20 of those. So it yep. breaks everything down through the bill of materials. However, when real life intervenes, yep. so although today, computer power is such that you could rerun your MRP every time a new order came in. Yeah, yeah. The, the mathematics are, are very sensitive to the input conditions. Mm -hmm. So if an order goes from 10 to 8, we would think that that will just reduce things a little bit and it will all work out. But it recalculates the optimum everything. from ground zero. Yeah. So everything's in the wrong place, everything's done mm -hmm. on the wrong day. So yeah. the work round for that was to introduce the, uh, the master production schedule. Yes, MPS, yeah. And say, we're not going to change anything. That's what we're going to make. So in, in effect, it was batch 
And, and if you've got highly variable real demand and short lead times, yeah. that's very difficult to manage. So you need human intervention. People use their intuition and experience mm -hmm. and, and overwrite MRP. Mm -hmm. And that was a feature that Carol and Chad found when they researched the use of MRP, that the majority of MRP companies also had a spreadsheet of people yep. to, to cope with those real life demands. It was the best they could do. What I see DDMRP doing is turning what the really experienced experts knew intuitively yeah. into something that is quite formulaic and people like me can go on a course, mm -hmm. they can come away with some formula, mm -hmm. we can use those the next day mm -hmm. and sad to say we can beat the success rate of the 30 year veteran. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but through doing something different. So rather than having deterministic mathematics under that, mm -hmm. underneath, mm -hmm. we chop the whole system into much smaller components. Mm -hmm. So step one of DDMRP is strategically decide where to put your decoupling points. Mm -hmm. So rather than a two week lead time, mm -hmm. we might have six or seven independent sections of three or four days or one or two days. Mm -hmm. So when demand varies, each of these sections is isolated with inventory from the next one. Mm -hmm. So in DDMRP, buffer inventory is at the heart of how it works. Mm -hmm. It's not safety, it's needed for day-to-day -day operations. Like, like your car, mm -hmm. you know, your shock absorbers are the day-to-day -day adjustments to keep the road smooth. You know, the, the DDMR, the MRP equivalent is the remote shock absorbers and you've felt everything. Yeah. So you have to do something else. Okay, so, so I don't know whether that makes some sense. It makes sense. sense. But, but so when we yeah. start using MPS, again, I had a, I had a blog yeah. on the five levels of planning, mm -hmm. you know, just starting from budget and SNOP, then MPS and then MRP. Yeah. So MPS is essentially doing the same because the idea is to, not essentially, or that, that's the idea of MPS, is to decouple the variation of day-to-day -day demand to more stable. Like you do your ABC analysis and you say, okay, I want to make this batch of 36, which is one week demand, rather than making six a day, I want to make 36 one day and then put it to safety stock because I know I'm going to sell it anyway, right? So, but in, 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 in a way, when I'm doing MPS, I'm producing my inventory, right? And then putting it into stock. But it sounds like the Monday when MRP is saying the same thing, or is it not? Uh, not necessarily, yeah. in that it's, it's putting stock at the best position. What, not, what, is the, what does the best position mean? Is it finished good or assembly point or what, what, what is the best position? Most of it will be at subcomponents in assembly. Okay. Either raw materials or at key control points during your manufacturing process. Right. It might be in finished goods, yeah. but that depends. DDMRP works just as well in uh, you know, engineer and manufacturer to order as it does um, manufacture okay. to stock. Okay, so ETO and made to order, engineer to order, it, it works equally yeah. same. Okay. Be because even engineer to order, very few customers will wait long enough yeah, for you to sure. go and dig some iron ore up and smelt it and, yeah, and, sure. and go from commodities. So you always need some inventory yeah. because customer tolerance time is shrinking. Yeah. And you know, one of the things about DDMRP, one of the one of the outputs you often see is it shrinks lead times. Mm -hmm. So if, if some of your competitors are using this to shrink lead times, customers will start only tolerating the shorter lead times, mm -hmm. like we all do with Amazon. Yeah. We expect next day delivery. Absolutely. Because yeah. one person offers it and everybody else has got to copy. Um, so that is, is one of the outputs will be uh, a shrinking of the lead time. So where they strategically right, right position to put your buffers, and we'll keep it simple, we'll talk about inventory, mm -hmm. will depend what sort of manufacturing process mm -hmm. you've got, whether, yep. you know, whether it's an A or a T-shaped manufacturer, uh, what your customer tolerance times are, where you've got integration points coming in, so it, that, that does depend what your particular situation, the range of products that you make, where variety comes into your supply chain. Mm. Okay. That makes sense? No, no, it, it, it makes sense. So let's, let's take 
-hmm. let's take a scenario where uh, we implemented. I think the, the concept of inventory buffer makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. But it's it's purely implemented into a manufacturing environment. Or for example, there's a lot of companies or distributors, if you want to call yeah. it, right? They just buy finished goods, right? Yeah. So would would they would they benefit from it? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. How? The, the uh, well the, the DDMRP the the is part of an overall process for for managing supply chains in business. Okay. Yeah. Technically, DDMRP is the bit that replenishes the inventories. Mm -hmm. So you decide where to put them, you develop an appropriate buffer profile mm -hmm. that takes a number of things into account. Uh, you, you, you use that as the basis of, of planning. You adjust those buffers dynamically based on real demand. Mm -hmm. So you, you let the system self-tune, whereas MRP needs people to decide that safety stock's too high, that one's too low. Uh, DDMRP builds a number of those loops back in oh. and makes it easier to adjust. So, so, so through software or through the through the logic itself? Uh, the logic, but for practical purposes, it needs software. Okay. So, um, once you get to a practical manufacturing scale. You've got thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of SKUs. Yes, yeah. you can't cover that. So, yeah, some of the decisions can be manually made. Some can be automated if you trust the system. Mm -hmm. So, when you see that certain bits of inventory uh, are always in excess, mm -hmm. in DDMRP terms, or always in blue or even green, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. then you can think, well, maybe we can lower that. Mm -hmm. And, and you can allow that to happen automatically to reduce it. Mm -hmm. And then if you see your buffers go down to the red zone more than you would expect them, then you can increase the levels. Mm -hmm. And you can allow that to happen by itself or you can choose to do it. You, you can also have sort of semi-automatic. So if you know that there is a marketing campaign mm -hmm. or you know the seasonal picture, yeah, yeah. then you can set the system up to automatically adjust the buffers upwards at a particular time and then let them naturally fall down when the demand truly disappears. Ne okay, that's so naturally I'm, I'm not that, that's that. what people would that's what experienced people would do. Would do, yes. Yeah. But they'd use their experience in the SMOP meeting. Yes, yes. Uh, the the demand driven process, it's always there on the checklist. It's always being asked. Okay. And if the answer is yes we have, then you know the the relatively you know, inexperienced but well-trained planner mm -hmm. knows what to do. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that's where it, it's both the method and much of the software will help do that for you. Okay. So okay. there's different methods, but it's all driven from what's happening in these buffers. Yeah. That are, they're, not, they're not there just for safety, they're there for operational control yeah. and stability. I'll, I'll come back to the software part again later, later yeah. on, right? So there's two, two, two pieces from the, from the planning execution. So to, to run the MRP or the traditional MRP correctly, right? I always uh, you know, uh, convince people and, and promote that you need to have a strong SMRP process, right? Yeah. You need to have your, you need to understand your demand, your unconstrained demand, and send your capacity. So you can come up with your, 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 your constrained demand and then you know, the whole demand review, capacity review, consensus yeah. review, executive review, right? So does demand review, again, I need to read the book. I have the book, by the way, I bought the book here. So I have it in my, my shelf as well. So I will, I'm definitely gonna read those now. Take some reading. Yeah, uh, so, so from that perspective, does the, the checklist of the SNOP, or let's call it the benefits of yeah. SNOP, is it included into the, the DDRB methodology or it is not? Or you still need a strong SNOP process? That's my question. It's, it's built into the wider demand-driven um, adaptive enterprise model. Mm -hmm. So DDMRP is like a, an engine at the heart. Yeah. It's, it's necessary yeah. and you can actually start there. However, if, if you've got the full system, yeah. you have demand-driven operation model, mm -hmm. which incorporates uh, manufacturing, identifying uh, leverage points and constrained manufacturing uh, stages. Mm -hmm. So you get into uh, buffer management and methods for managing the manufacturing element. DDMRP itself is more replenishment and stock. So you still need a SNOP process? Ah, I'm, I'm not even got there yet. Yeah. 
In addition to that, you need something that, if you are in manufacturing, you need uh, the demand driven operating model that will synchronize your toll manufacturers and your own manufacturing assets. Yeah. Again, through buffer management in exactly the same way. Then that integrates to demand driven uh, sales and operational planning. Mm -hmm. So there is a process and protocol for tying in DDMRP and the demand driven operating model are the rules for day to day and week to week operation. Mm -hmm. okay. They will not tell you what direction to go in, right. they will not tell you that there's a marketing campaign coming up in three months' time yeah. or your competitor is He's doing nerdy. this. That's where the traditional SNOP from the point of view of a cross functional group needs to get together. But what, what I found fascinating was the uh, anyway. The guy who invented the SNOP textbook, Dick Ling, yeah. who's, who's in his 80s, came out of retirement to work with Carol and Chad to help them develop demand driven SNOP. Very nice. And nice. Dick, Dick is actually the guy who invented the master production checking. Yeah. He actually said, right, if we had this, we wouldn't have needed the master production checking. And that to me yes, is a great yeah, deal I, I, of credibility. So, I agree with that. And then, then, then beyond that, there's a few steps in the demand-driven adapted enterprise, uh, which, which you start to think about what market should we be in, what's holding our business back, and, and things like that. But yes, demand-driven SNOP ties very closely to demand-driven MRP and the demand-driven operating model. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they started here. Now you might think, well, you need to start strategically. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, from a practical point of view, you can start by taking DDMRP in the equations. Mm -hmm. Don't even worry about, is your inventory in the right place? Mm -hmm. Just use where you've got inventory mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Ask what the 50 or 100 most painful SKUs are mm -hmm. that your people will tell you. Yep, yeah, yeah. Take them off MRP calculation, put them on a spreadsheet. Yeah. You can run DDMRP as a method on a spreadsheet for 50, 100, 200 SKUs very easily. Mm -hmm. You just get something every, every day, see what the incoming demand is, see what the usage is yesterday, mm -hmm. just update the spreadsheet, press the button. Okay, these I leave, this I need to order six, this I need to order 60. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that is what the majority of large companies who've implemented uh, demand driven have done. They've not started with a big bank, so they've started, not started with, with lots of consultants. Test, tested them in a small way, proved the yeah. concept, then you take it to the highest level. They've sent somebody on a thousand euro training course. Yeah. The next day, they have worked on a spreadsheet. The next month, their bosses come and say, what's, what's happened? You know, nobody's ringing me. I've come here because I think it's a disaster. Because normally the bosses are told, ah, oh, we've got a problem, can you ring this customer because we've run out of this and that. And very quickly stability arrived. Yeah. And, and it's only then that the companies say, right, but we've got 15,000 SKUs. You can't do that on a spreadsheet. Yeah. And then you say, okay, we need some software. Yeah. Okay, so before we come back to the software yeah. piece, last question. One thing which used to annoy me when, uh, when I was a supply chain manager and a demand planner myself, that you, you, you download the whole 12 months data, you do your value volume frequency analysis, yeah. then you set up your safety stall again, your batch quantities and so on and so forth, the, the famous concept of plan for every part, right? And then you run it again in six months time, everything you've done is no more valid and you have to do this, the whole thing again and everybody's waiting for you for a week, right? Yep. So does the demand driven MRP requires that sort of, let's call it data management on a regular basis? Because I have a, I have a strong debate actually. For me, I think most of the ERP, I have wrote a blog on ERP sucks because yes. They are not, you know, we love in the, in the world of, you know, everybody talks about artificial intelligence and machine learning. For me, the MRP should be, or the ERP system which have an MRP logic built in, maybe DDRP, MRP as well. It should be start, smart enough that when the data passes through the, the grid or the logic, it should start telling you, right, okay, the demand is going down, or check the history, seasonality, change your safety <laughs> stock, change your batch quantity, change the parameters. The system should be smart enough. So, I hope we one day will get there. So, my, my question is this. So where does the demand of your need that sort of exercise every three to six months? Yes or no? 
it needs the right data in there, or yes. good enough data. Yeah. Uh, in, in many of the setups, it can work within a range. So you have sort of yeah. families of data rather than exact numbers. But yes, you do know, you do need to know, for example, what the reliable replenishment time is for an SKU. Yes. Uh, now, I'm not an MRP expert, but nine times out of ten when I've looked at an MRP system, all the lead times are the same. Mm, either, yeah. not, either 90 days or 180 Hardly days, yes, yeah. which, which were a bulk upload when the consultants started it in the first place. Yeah. And then the planners are wondering why the uh, replenishment recommendations are crazy. Yeah, yeah. And the reason they're crazy is very often the data's left as it was at the beginning, yeah. which is totally unreliable. Yeah. So definitely it needs a good enough data to start with. Data to start with. Now, the average use is system calculated. Okay. Now the average demand is not a manual. It needs to be a manual input on day one. Yes. But then that will self tune. Okay. Uh, and, and I actually don't know, but I would expect most of the other systems will do a sanity check on things like lead time data. But that's exactly the same as any okay. other system. Mm -hmm. But most most. MRPs, ERPs that I've seen, yeah, yeah. need a person to decide to do that. Yeah, yeah. The system doesn't flag up that we've got some problems with certain SKUs. That, that's one of the beauties of using the, the theory of constraints thinking and the right sort of buffers, is what buffers do is it helps you ignore the 98% of stuff that's going along fine and to identify the 2% of stuff that is a problem in the making or is an opportunity. Mm. So, e even if you had to do it manually, an extract from a DD bit of DDMRP software would put things in priority order. So, for example, that's what it does for expediting. You do not expedite when somebody rings you and said, where the hell are the widgets because we've got none, mm -hmm. but I need some. The expediter goes when the stock level is in the red, you've still got some, yeah. but in the red means if things happen as normal, or average, we will win out, or we're getting close to But we shouldn't need expert as we need the other way, or still yeah. do we need... You, oh, you do, because stuff happens. Variation happens. You don't need as many, yeah. and you tell them exactly where to look. Okay. So, you need a lot fewer, but the expediters are preventing a fire, mm -hmm. rather than the traditional expediters, they only discover when when you're already late yeah, then, or you're self already, is, self already is out of stock. Yeah. The idea of buffers is when either a delivery time or a stock level is in the yellow or the green, yeah. or even a little bit of the red, you don't worry about it, but when it's a long way in the red, then you so the, the, yeah. the expediter's priority list is sorted by buffer penetration. Yeah. Yeah. Any that have gone black, which means we have run out, mm -hmm. you'll still get stock outs, because stuff happens that is unpredictable. Yeah. But they'll reduce by several orders of magnitude. Oh. But then you put yeah. the red things in order. No. So yeah, you still need people, but it's a lot less stressful environment. Oh, makes sense. That makes sense. Makes sense, absolutely. I think uh, this, it sounds like uh, yeah, so I think the experienced people who have figured it out by the experience now, the, 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 I think the, 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 the methodology asking to do it anyway and with more efficiency, that's great. So let's move to the software side, right? Yeah. Most of the ERP, you know, I've used uh, BPIX, I've used uh, SAP, I've used uh, BAN and stuff. They have a traditional MRP logic built in, right? And they will show you the grid and you can go and download the report and you can you can see that. Mm -hmm. So which software have the DDR MRP built in? Because I know SAP has uh, now trying to, to Sa promote. Sa SAP has introduced a, yeah. Yeah, a, a module. Yeah. Um, uh, a handful of the big ERP systems. Um, NetSuite, I was Net, hearing. Net, NetSuite's had one of the first. Yeah. Uh, IFS has got uh, a, a certified. Okay. Now, the, the demand-driven institute does certify software. Uh, it doesn't charge for the certification, by the way. Okay, perfect. So th there's, no, there's no commercial pressures there. Anyone can apply. 
And actually, it's got a list of software that's applied and, and going through the process. And last time I looked, they had a list of software that claims to be, but hasn't been certified. But last time I looked, there's just short of 30 different softwares. The majority are middleware. So the majority of implementations mm -hmm. are yes. use specialist middleware, turn off the MRP module, yeah. and, and they will they will do the data synchronization. Right. So they will pull so the plugins and all that. Yeah. yeah, they they will pull from your purchasing module, they'll pull from your sales, inventory tracking module, module yeah. and your sales module, and all they will do is they will spit out replenishment orders. Right. Right. Uh, if it's DDMRP. Yeah. Okay. If the purchase order or works order for manufacturing both, which MRP does. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so, so, so that, that, that's the bit it replaced. Makes sense. There, there, there are certified software for the demand driven operating model, which is about scheduling a manufacturing resource, your, um, your constraint bottleneck yeah. resource. Uh, and there's also a few that do the uh, demand driven SNOP. They've just started, but there's a lot fewer of those. Oh, I, I don't know what the rules are, but I know there's two or three software that's got to so, that stage. Just la last two questions, actually. The, the second one, I think you, when we were debating on LinkedIn, you mentioned a couple of uh, technical terms. Yeah. Right? I would like to actually explain those, right? But, which is, you said does not exist in a digital MRP. Okay. Uh, I think, I think what, one of them was the net flow equation. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Which, which is a simple equation to say, uh, should, I should I place a replenishment order today? Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, let, 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 let's see if I can cover it simply, yeah, but, yeah, sure, but sure. understandably enough. So, a stock keeping unit which has some buffer, that buffer will be divided into a green, yellow and a red component. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as, as is shown on the front of the uh, of, of the book, so when you're you're not looking at the inventory, mm -hmm. you're looking at the net flow. Now the net flow takes account of the stock on hand, the stock that's coming in, mm -hmm. and the qualified demand that's coming. Yeah. So it, it nets these primarily these three bits of data off and com comes up with a number. Yeah. So actual stock stock that's on its way less demand over a period that we define mm -hmm. gives you the net they call it the net flow yeah. when that net flow is in the yellow you replace a replenishment order enough to take to, it to, to the, the top of green so, so it's, it's kind of going to a reorder point it is but yeah. it, it is the reorder point okay because reorder point it, it's the formula that tells you when to reorder yeah. and how much okay uh, but that's, that's the thing that's calculated every single day. Mm -hmm. So if it's, uh, if it's in the green, it means we, we're comfortable, we might have some on order, we may not. If it's in the yellow, that will mean we should have some on order. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as part of the sort of calculation of these buffers, the, the process takes account of, do we order on a calendar cycle? Mm -hmm. yeah, every X days, do we have a minimum order quantity or can we be flexible? So the, the, those are three different ordering styles are, are built in. Mm -hmm. um, the, the actual inventory you know, is something else that's looked at by the system, not, the, not just the net flow, but the actual inventory, as on the front of the book, will probably float between red and yellow. Yeah. As I say, if it gets too far into red, yeah. that will trigger expediting which is but, we don't want, of course. but if the expediter said it's on the road it's coming tomorrow they should be right. job done yeah, yeah. if 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 there's been a fire that the supplier's not told you about yeah. at least you've found out four days before you've run out yeah, yeah. That, so, does that make sense it, it makes the, sense absolutely the, the the other the other one i mentioned and, and i don't know to what extent it's it's used elsewhere was sort of prioritized share which, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. which was used in distribution yes. mainly, where you want a full lorry. Yeah. You do not want to send a half empty lorry. So where you've got nodes and a, a central, a regional and a, and a local distribution centre and you're pulling supply from one to the other, you might want to fill a truck. Yeah. You simply use 
buffer as a prioritization. So you say, this, this inventory is not at the level to trigger a replenishment order yet. Mm -hmm. However, it's the closest to doing so. So you prioritize, and so you, you pull an order forwards that you don't need, but it makes economic sense. Either because of a lorry, yeah. or you know, if we order a $1,000, we get free shipping, you know, that sort of stuff. Okay. Can also get right. built in. So it will it will fill up a truck, right. fill up an order. Yeah. Pay better payment terms. Yeah, stuff like that that people will always do. Yeah. But now it's built in. But, but now, now the systems that are compliant will right. also do that for you. Last question. So right now I'm a historical user of MRP, you know, using it for, for many years. I want to, you know, start do, uh, deploying or start my journey okay. on demand driven. So where should I start? Um, I, I'd start doing one of the training courses. Okay, from it, it's, it's, Demand Driven Institute. Yeah, it's all in the book. Okay, is it online or, or not? Or you have to go? Uh, yeah, there are, there are some that are done online yeah. and those are taught by uh, Carol and Chad. Yeah. Or there's a whole network of certified and accredited trainers. Okay, and you are one of them, I believe? Uh, no, 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 I've not okay. done that. I've been on the course. Okay. I, if, if, if I was consulting in this field, I would be. Okay. And, uh, and I'd like to think I'm passed, but no, I, I passed the exam at the end of the course. Okay. That's what I can claim. Uh, but I do know a number of people who are. So, so they provide both public courses and um, in-house training courses. Right. Uh, you can read it in the book, but for a lot of people, being being taken through the book in a couple of days, being shown the equations, make sure they understand it, mm -hmm. is enough. But two days, next day, take some of your current inventory positions, intuitively the ones that are problematic. If you haven't got problems, by the way, uh, choose you know, a range of fast and slow movers, uh, different types of components, just to give you self-comfort that it works in different scenarios. So then take those SKUs, 40, 50, 60, 70, mm -hmm. write yourself an equation, put the starting data in, and then just use that spreadsheet to say when to replenish. And then see what happens. And the, the cases I've seen, it's sort of nine times out of 10, after a relatively short period of time, stockouts reduce, inventory goes down uh, and if you're in a manufacturing environment the lead time would start going down okay obviously when you're in a replenishment environment it's slightly different if you're piloting it obviously don't have too many slow movers because it'll take you a year to get any feedback yeah, yeah. it'll so still work so start with the pilot but it'll just take too long if you're and that's low risk you know, I know companies like BT in the UK, Michelin, a whole host of other small companies as well have done exactly that. Okay. You, you don't sense. need consultants. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not selling it. They can be useful, but you don't need them. But you, with the experience of lighting folks, can, can, by yeah. reading the book, maybe a course, can but, start, uh, can start with and, it, and it's not a like big bang that's an act of faith that says, we invest $100 million in this fancy software Perfect. and life will be better. We've said, Life has got better. Let's use the software to cement the benefits that if you have, see. Yeah, if you, you, you yeah. see the benefits. Of the Do the pilot if you have, you know, like I used to have 50,000 SKUs, you've got to use the software. Yeah. To the and, and then Perfect. once you've done it with your existing stocks, you yeah. can move into the formal process and say, right, strategically, where is the best place to put inventory? Yeah. Do, we, do we bring some of our important suppliers into the equation? Okay. Uh, yeah, have I have I got the situation where, like you had in retail, where your inventory level might only be one or two, mm -hmm. and, and then the equations don't quite work yeah. the same. They need tweaking. But don't start there. Start at the easy stuff. How's uh, any last thoughts before we finish? Any last thoughts? Uh, no, no. Anyone involved in uh, the distribution replenishment? Yeah. Uh, even at the supply end, providing raw materials for an organization. This is something you can implement within your area of work. And if you're being set the very difficult challenge of maintaining service levels, but freeing up working capital, then 
for me, it's a great place to start. Lots of people are doing it. It can be done below the radar, yeah. at relatively low risk. Yeah. Because if you're a planner, you expect to that's do this great, That's a great advice. That's yeah. a great the boss advice. doesn't need to know that you're using yeah. this fancy schmancy method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just do it. And, uh, and show the benefits and show and, and, see it look, and, and, and if it doesn't work for you, you know, you're probably no worse off than you are today. Good. So Ian has successfully converted me, right today, <laughs> right? You know, because we have a debate, and you know, because I think my, my my final thought is this, as as Ian said. So I think the successful or or, or experienced supply chain folks who knows MRP, knows about SNOP, knows about MPS, know what decoupling or demand. I know the fact the data get obsolete and you have to do that, right? I think all those, let's call it historical good practices has been combined into a methodology. That's my, my feeling. I still need to read the book. Yeah, right? the, the, right. the, that's and more. easily trainable. Easily trainable and, and more linked with the theory of constraint. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to, to dive into it and hopefully if, uh, you will see some blogs coming out of from, from me as well on this. Uh, hopefully doing the same thing, promoting the good stuff, right? And Ian, I look forward to seeing how it's gone. Thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Great to meet you. Appreciate it. Cheers. Yep. I aim to do knowledge videos and interviews with procurement and supply chain professionals and leaders. Consider subscribing to this channel. And I have written practical guides on supply chain. See the link below.